for those who've been here each evening, you should have noticed something. Did anyone notice something about all of the messages as you've been here each and every night? Anybody notice something about them all? Hey, Matt. <laughs> They're all coming from Genesis. That's right. Good, 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 good. I'm glad to see that someone is paying attention to that. They're all coming from Genesis. Uh, on Friday night, we talked about Genesis 1, 2, and 3, uh, but we especially looked at the fall, uh, which is in Genesis 3. Even Saturday morning, we looked at Genesis 2, and we talked a little bit about the Sabbath there in Genesis 2. On Sunday evening, we looked at Genesis the fourth chapter uh, where we see the story of Cain killing his brother Abel. Based on that paradigm, what should be the text that we come from or the chapter we come from tonight? Chapter 5. That's great reasoning. Great reasoning. Uh, on tomorrow night then, we should be looking at what? Chapter, oh good, y'all are with me now. Chapter 6. Let me just let you know now, uh, chapter 6 of Genesis is going to be tomorrow night, and chapter 6 and, and 7 and 8 uh, happens to be the story, and 9, happens to be the story of the flood. Now many of us have know that story well. There are four facts about the flood that you need to know, and we're going to go over those tomorrow night. You need to know. Now, now you might know the facts but but what you're going what we're going to go over tomorrow is why you need to know those four facts all right so even if you know them you need to know why you need to know them amen that's tomorrow night but as you said tonight we should look at Genesis 5 that's what that's what sister Jackie just told us amen <laughs> what I want us to do <laughs> we're going to start if it's okay <laughs> At chapter 4, verse 17, and then we'll read into chapter 5. Genesis chapter 4, verse 17, and we'll read all the way into chapter 5, the first few verses there. But we're going to look at both chapters. And tonight I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the translation. The Bible says, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Just so you know, this isn't the Enoch that we know very well who walked with God and went up to glory. This is not that Enoch. To Enoch was born Erod, and Erod fathered Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech, and Lamech took two wives, the name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah, Ada bore Jebel, he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock, his brother's name was Jubal, he was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Chapter 5, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God, male and female. He created them, and he blessed them and named them man, or Adam, when, he, when they were created. When Adam lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Now, in all of your years, 
you might have never heard someone preach about the begats. Huh? Well, tonight someone's going to preach about the begats. Because I believe there is gospel. There is good news. There is healing in the begats. There is something that we need to know as it relates to the begats. And so tonight as we begin the message, I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all of your many blessings to us. Indeed, you are great and you are worthy of praise. Tonight, Lord, as we have read from your holy word, we pray that the spirit of the living God might speak to us tonight. May we learn from your word. Might your word and your spirit be our teacher tonight. And may your word and your spirit transform us that we might be more like you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Now, the word of God tells us in the very first chapter that when God made Adam and Eve, he made them in his image. One aspect of being made in his image implies that Adam and Eve had a likeness like God. They were like him. Now, one way that Adam and Eve were like God, uh, we know that they were like him in character. They were flawless. But another aspect of being like God was that combined, you remember we said it's not just Adam who bore God's image, it's Adam and Eve. They were equal opposites, and when you put it together, it reflects the image of God. One way that, that is a physical way that you can see the image of God in Adam plus Eve is in the fact that combined, they have creative power. No man can, can, can create by himself. And even though woman is the vehicle through which God brings life. Woman cannot bring life into existence by herself. It takes man plus woman to create life, and therefore the image of God is seen when you combine male plus female. That's one way you see that image. Again, just a little note there. It is not surprising that there is such a strong onslaught of attack on the image of God as it relates to sexuality. Those of you who might have any uh, um, familiarity with the, the world of sports, you know that uh, uh, just, is it today or yesterday? Yesterday, just yesterday, uh, Jason Collins, seven feet tall, about 240 pounds, 34 years old, played in the NBA about 13 years for, uh, for a number of teams. He's a free agent now, may not play anymore, who knows, but, but he is the first openly gay professional sports player in any major sport. The first. And that is monumental. Because, uh, you, know, you know, it's a big breakthrough when, when someone makes it into politics or so forth and so on and they're openly gay. But, but no breakthrough has happened in sports. In the sporting arena, people have this uh, notion that, you know, uh, you're supposed to be so, 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 so tough and somehow that means that you can't be homosexual. And yet, there are many in, in the world of sports, there are many, uh, but he is the first. It is rumored that there are a number of others that plan to come out in secession to make this ground swell as the country is in this debate about homosexuality. It is not surprising, or at least it should not be, that there is an onslaught against the image of God as it relates to sexuality. Are you with me? Now, that's one way you see the image, but, but, but image is also seen because the, the, the child reflects the character, looks like, and acts like, and thinks like, and behaves like the parent. Now, like you, if you're a parent, 
Uh, there is an excitement that happens when you have a child, am I right? Uh, there is an enthusiasm, uh, but, but, but also there is this sense that when you have a child as a parent, you, you immediately start to look at the features so you can see, well, do they have my nose or her nose? Huh? Is that my eyes or his eyes? Now, when I was born, I don't remember this, this is what I was told. Uh, both of my parents are much darker than I am. And when I was born, and, and, and my mother has hair that uh, some, uh, well, it's, it's extra curly, amen. Uh, and my dad's uh, hair is straight down his back, straight, completely straight, no curls, straight down his back. When I was born, I was born with blue eyes, and I was born much brighter and lighter <laughs> than I am today, much lighter. And my hair was curly, but not curly like my mom's curls. <laughs> it wasn't straight like my dad's hair, but it was curly. Very, very, very light skin with blue eyes. My parents had to do a check on that wristband. Huh? Check that wristband. Make sure we got the right one. <laughs> Anytime a, 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 a child is born, we often look for resemblance to the parent and, and we discuss who does she look like, who does he look like. And, and you know, as proud parents, uh, parents almost always want to say, oh, that's my, that, that's my eyes and those are my hands and fingers. And, and grandparents are even worse. I remember my grand, my, 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 not my grandmother, my mother, my mother, when she saw our kids uh, said, oh, both of them, when they were both born, they both look just like Carl. And sure enough, when Diane's mother saw both kids, she said, they look just like Diane. I don't know how it's possible to look exactly like both parents, but, but, but that's, that, that's what you look for. You look for resemblance. You look for the image to be duplicated or replicated in the child. The Bible tells us when God made Adam and Eve, God made them in his image. They resembled him. They looked like him. They acted like him. They thought like him. They had the character of God. But the Bible tells us something happened when sin entered the world. The Bible says when Adam and Eve had Seth, Seth was made in Adam's image. There's a new image now. And, and, and as we look at the begats, we notice that there is some similarities in the image of the father upon the son. Look at the, the character of Cain and look at the character of his descendants. The Bible is trying to paint a picture for us. Now, whenever you read a begats, a begats just tell you whose child is whose and whose parent is whose. But whenever they start to give you some details, the details matter because those are exceptions to the begats. The, the, the parent is Cain. We know a whole lot about Cain. But then we find out a whole lot about one of his sons, one of his descendants named Lamech. Cain the Bible says, kills his brother. And he says, my debt is too much to bear. I cannot bear this debt, this punishment from you, God. And God says, oh, don't worry, I'll take vengeance sevenfold on anyone who touches you. But as we skip down and we see his son Lamech, Lamech, first of all, takes two wives. He's a womanizer. First womanizer in scripture. Cain is bad, Lamech is worse. And not only is he a womanizer, but then he kills someone who attacks him. Uh, so, so, so he has more justification, he thinks, but he kills someone who attacks him. And then he says, if, if Cain is avenged sevenfold, I'm avenged seventy-sevenfold. In other words, his measure of vengeance is even stronger than his great-great-great-great-grandfather. And so we see that Cain passes on a certain characteristic to his descendants. 
It is not just something made up out of the air when people talk about generational curses or generational issues. There is something that is passed on from generation to generation to generation. There is an image, a likeness of the father to the son to the grandson to the great grandson. Oh, it's not only in the bad family of Cain. You also see it when you get down later in Genesis. You see it in the family of Abraham. Abraham, though he is a faithful guy, he's called the father of the faithful. Yet we see in the life of Abraham that on two separate occasions, when Abraham's life is in danger and his wife is about to be taken uh, to be with the king, Abraham tells a bold-faced lie. And then... Later on in the story, we see Isaac go and tell the exact same lie. And not to be outdone, they have a son named Jacob whose name itself means liar. And to make sure that he lived up to his name, he deceived his parents and his brother for the birthright. Oh, and it didn't stop there. Jacob had 12 boys. And what do they do? They kill or they, you know, act like they killed their brother Joseph. And then they come back and do what? Lie to their daddy. Why? Because the father, Abraham, passed on a trait, a characteristic to his children. They were made in his image. And so the character that he had, he passed on a tendency to his children. Be careful what habits and practices you have, you develop. And young people, you're young enough, you're at the stage where you're developing your character. Be careful the character that you choose to develop, the habits that you choose to develop. Some habits that you develop now, you might overcome later, but your children can get those same characteristics and they may not overcome it as easily. The story of Cain is a sad one because Cain's family is uh, a whole lineage of people who are fighting against God, who are violent, who are vengeful. And you see it with Cain, and then you see it with Lamech. But there's another reason that we're considering this lineage of Cain as well as Seth. The name Seth means uh, uh, it basically means someone who's in place of. Now, Diane and I had lost a child, a son. We lost a son before Carl was born. And uh, our son lived 45 minutes in my hands and then died in my hands after 45 minutes. We named him, we had a birth certificate made up, and we named him Carl Alexander Brewer Jr. Because I'm Carl Alexander Brewer. And so that's what we named him. And he died. And so when Carl was born, we named him Carl Seth Alexander Brewer II. Seth, because he is, uh, we lost the first male child just as Adam and Eve lost their son Abel. And then they named their son Seth. But Adam and Eve naming Seth, Seth, had another message to it. They seemed to get the promise in Genesis 3.15. See, in Genesis 3, God said that there would be a war between the snake and the woman and between his descendants and her descendants. That war they started to get when Cain kills his brother. And they start to realize Cain is not the appointed Messiah. Cain is not the, the descendant who's going to be the savior of the human race. No, Cain is one of the descendants of the snake who's warring against the descendants of God. And so when they have a third son, they name the third son Seth because Seth is now in place of Seth is the one whose lineage is going to be the one where the Messiah comes. There's a war between Cain's lineage and Seth's lineage. 
Yes, Seth is made after the image of Adam, but it will be through Seth's lineage where the people of God learn to follow God. That is why at the end of chapter 4, it says when Seth is born, at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. It's Seth's descendants who usher in worship of the only true God. Let me show you one other thing here about Seth's descendants. We're not going to read all of it because all of the begats and all these names are so hard to pronounce even after taking Hebrew class. So I'm just going to skip down to verse 20, uh, verse 21 of chapter 5. It says, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, if you read the descendants of Seth, the begats, there's a whole bunch of begats, but they stop to tell us about Enoch. You have to pay attention when the Bible in a begat list stops to tell you something about them. It stops to tell us about Lamech in Cain's descendants, and it stops to tell us about Enoch in Seth's descendants. Well, the fact that it stops there makes you wonder, is there some comparison that's trying to be made? Well, if you just do a simple math, just count the names that are listed there, what you will find is that Lamech is the seventh generation from Adam on Cain's side. And Enoch is the seventh generation of Adam on Seth's side. In other words, while one lineage of Adam is producing someone who is violent and vengeful and a womanizer, the other side of Adam's lineage is producing someone who is getting closer and closer to God, so much so that God just took him to glory because Enoch was so much like God. You have Lamech and you have Enoch. You have Cain, you have Seth. You have two groups going in opposite directions from the same heritage, the same family, the same father. How? Because one chooses, one chooses, one chooses to call upon the name of the Lord. That's the difference with Cain's heritage. That's the difference with Cain's heritage. Well, the Bible tells us that though you and I might be in the image of our parents, we can have a new image. We can be made in a new image and have a new likeness. For the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ came down to earth as a second Adam. And the reason he came as a second Adam is because the first Adam produces both Cain's and Seth's. It produces bad and good. When he ate from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he produced in his, in his lineage an, uh, 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 an a, a unlimited potential both for evil and for good. But the lineage of Jesus has only good. And so God sent Jesus Christ to be a second Adam so that anyone who wanted out from that first heritage. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at my family tree, uh, there's, some, there's some good and there's some, some not so good. Huh? Uh, when I was in the seminary, uh, one of the requirements for every seminary student before you get a master's degree in divinity, uh, there's this class that you have to take. I don't remember the class, but in the class they require, actually it was a counseling class, that's right. It was uh, my counseling class. And one of the requirements of the class, they require that you do a family tree. And the family tree is unlike any family tree I had ever done. I've done, you know, the names and just draw names. And so they said, no, no, that's not sufficient. In order for you to do this family tree, you need a whole lot of symbols. And there's this computer program that you can use to do it and they have a whole bunch of symbols they have symbols for divorces all right and so when you put you know auntie and uncle you got to put all the wives that he divorced and remarried 
Mm -hmm. and, and then they have a symbol for, uh, uh, for if there was, Lord have mercy, if there was ever some incest in the family, you put that one on the family tree. If there was ever some drug addiction in the family, you put that on the tree. That, that tree is a, is a full mess. A whole lot of stuff on that tree. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, <laughs> and at first, when I, I was assigned the project, I said, you know what? There's no way I'm going to be able to do this because my family, like many families, uh, folk don't talk much about some of that stuff. You know, I first went to my mother and said, Mom, you know, I have this project I have to do for school. It's a requirement. I can't graduate unless I do this project, and they're hoping I can get all the way back to great, great, great grandparents. Um, Mom, can you, can you give me the names? And she gave me the names, and I drew out the tree. I said, okay, Mom. Now, you know, this person was married to. Is this the only person they're married to? And I can get some of that information. I said, now, Mom, I was told I need to also find out some, some other problems that might have been in the family, some incest, some addiction. Addictions, and, and I, that was about it. That was it. That's where it stopped. But praise God for, for grandparents and great-grandparents who are, uh, as one of my mentors says, uh, he says he's too old to, uh, he, he doesn't have a, a what did he say? He, he, I can't remember how he said it, but, but basically there's no stop button anymore as old as he is. That's what one of my mentors said. So you ask him a question, it just comes out. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't filter it as, as easily as he used to. You know, if, if I ask you something, you'll process it and say, well, how do I want to respond? But, but if I ask him, he'll just tell me whatever comes to his head. And so I went to my grandparents, and, and I could say, listen, Grandma, um, I, I'm doing this project. Can you tell me about, uh, and, and she just started rattling off information. Yeah, Uncle Johnny was doing this <laughs> with this one. I said, good Lord, have mercy. And you know, cousin uh, so-and-so, you thought that was cousin so-and-so, but that's not actually that uncle's child. That's that one's child. And, and boy, I found out a whole lot of information about the family. And once the tree was finished, what you find on that tree is, just like doctors tell you to do this with medicine, with health issues, they say if you see heart conditions in your grandparents and then parents, they tell you you might want to watch out even though you're young and healthy because heart condition is a problem in your family. Well, the same thing I found as I looked at my family lineage. On one side of the family, I could see a certain problem, and it went to every single man in the family every one of them on one side of the family and on the other side of the family I saw another problem that that occurred it didn't happen to men it happened some to women some to men but I saw another uh, problem that occurred on the other side of the family and it was fairly consistent after I showed that to my wife Diane said boy I want to do the same thing with my family it wasn't a requirement for her for any of her class, but she wanted to do it anyway. She couldn't get very far, unfortunately, because her grandparents had already passed away. <laughs> but she tried to find information, and as she searched, she also found out that there's some similarities on, uh, on problems that are on one side of the family as well. If you ever did such a project, you'd probably find the same thing is true in your family. That there are certain problems that run down the line. Why? Because you're made in the image of that parent. And if God doesn't do something to break that cycle, and if you don't make a choice to surrender, then you will more than likely fall into line just like everyone else does. But I'm so glad for Jesus. Because the gospel tells us that Jesus created a new tree. Jesus created a new family tree. And because Jesus has come and created a new family tree, to anyone who surrenders to him, the Bible says, I will make you a new creation. Behold, I make all things new. And Jesus doesn't just say, I make you a new person. No, the word is a new creation. In other words, Jesus has come so that you and I can be a part of a whole nother world, not, not just the, the messed up world that we're a part of. He's come so that we can be citizens of this world, but citizens of that world at the same time. It's a dual citizenship. I have a friend of mine who is a citizen in 
Jamaica, and then he came to the U.S., and he got a citizenship here. I said, man, did you, you, you denounced your Jamaica? He said, no, 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 I have, a, I have a dual citizenship. I have a dual citizenship. Right now, he's pastoring in the U.S., uh, and, and, and he wanted to make sure that he retained both citizenships uh, because he is Jamaican, that's his heart, but he wanted to live and have his family and so forth so on here in this country as a dual citizenship. The Bible tells us that our citizenship is in heaven, not it will be in heaven. To everyone who accepts Jesus Christ as their savior, Jesus gives you a new identity and it is a heavenly identity. You don't even know what that identity is. That's why he's going to give you a new name when he comes because you don't even know who exactly you really are in him. But in Christ, you are new. You're a part of a new creation. You have a new identity. You have a new heritage. You have a new lineage. You have a new parentage. And you have a new future in Christ. To everyone who accepts the gift of Jesus Christ, you can be remade in a new image with a new likeness. You say, well, how does that happen? How does that happen? Well, I would suggest to you, how do you get a new citizenship in this country? You apply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You apply. You apply. You apply. Amen. You apply. Yeah, you apply. And too often, we, 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 we want change, but we don't actually go to the office to apply. We don't apply anything. We just hope for it or talk about it, but we don't ever apply. Well, how do you get a new citizenship into the kingdom of God? You apply for it. You apply for it. You make the decision that this is no longer going to be my path. I'm going to accept a new one. And Jesus has already put up all the money for you to get a new citizenship. You don't have the excuse that it costs too much for all that paperwork. No, Jesus already paid for all of that. The paperwork is paid for. You just have to actually go and apply. It's paid for by Jesus Christ. Well, the question is, do we accept the gift of a new image, a new likeness, a new citizenship, a new heritage in Christ? Tonight, I want to appeal to someone, all heads bowed and eyes closed, and I don't ever take it for granted, I don't ever want to take it for granted that we are all saved in this place. And so tonight, if someone, if someone, you know your family heritage, you know your own background, but tonight you want a new future, you want to be remade into the likeness, the image of Jesus. You want a new start in him. And even while you live here on earth, you want your life and lifestyle and your citizenship to be that of heaven. You want to be remade. If that is you, I invite you to stand with me and we're going to close with prayer tonight. Heart and purify me, purify me, create in me a clean heart so I may worship thee. Cast me not away from thy presence, please don't take your spirit from me and restore the joy of salvation so that I may worship thee. All heads bowed and all eyes closed. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, because you've reminded us that we are not bound by our heritage, our parentage, our ancestry. 
but we can have a new image and be remade because of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that we might apply. Lord, I pray that we might receive, accept that gift that you have given to us. Lord, we know we do not deserve it, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we can have a new life in Christ. And Lord, that new life is not a uh, just today only, but Lord, every single day, may we apply that blood of Jesus Christ to our life that we might be transformed by your blood. And Lord, we need not be bound by our parents' mistakes or our grandparents' mistakes as long as we apply that blood to our life and rely on Jesus Christ and his spirit. Thank you so much for Jesus. And Lord, as we depart tonight, we pray that the spirit of the living God might keep us just as you kept Enoch, that we might walk with you and talk with you. And one day soon when you come, Lord, you will take us to be with you forever and ever. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.